Contenders, ready! Gladiators, ready! Three, two, one! The Gladiators! Hello and welcome to the Glad Pod. In association with Gladiators TV, I'm David Blackmore and here with me once more is Jet and producer Paul. One thing, guys, that caught my eye in the mailbag this week was something that I think we discussed towards the latter end of series one. What would our, well, what would Paul and I's names be if uh, we were going to be Gladiators? I can't remember. I'm racking my brains now. I can't think that I actually, I, I was put on the spot and I couldn't remember. And I said I would come back and think of it. And I don't think I've thought of it since. It needed to be something D related. But I need to keep thinking about this. But anyway, we have had people write in to say what their name would be. Andy wrote in to say if he was a Gladiator, he'd want to be called Merlin with maybe his theme song being Queen's A Kind of Magic as his theme tune. Die, that is a winning combination, isn't it? I love that. I'm trying to think what your signature move would be. With the Merlin, I think it would be like some kind of like... Because he was a wizard, wasn't he, Merlin? So surely it would be something that way inspired. Something with a, a pirouette. Sorry, <laughs> just going to choreograph your signature move like with a big cape or something quite dramatic. Yes, there were no... Oh, this is a tangent now, and I'm putting Paul on the spot again here. We're talking about capes. Were, none of the gladiators um, from any of the other series in terms of international, no, did they even have a cape? Yeah, there was one, actually, I think, that sprung to mind. And it's somebody who I've mentioned on this podcast in the previous series from the Swedish gladiators, who is this big, massive guy called El Gringo. And he had a big kind of cape on, and he'd come out into the arena with being covered up and stuff, and then he'd take it off, and he was this big, massive guy. Maybe we should get him on the podcast, you know. El Gringo from the Swedish Gladiators. We should get him on. Definitely. And then there's Matthew who says that that he would always have wanted to have been called Tiger. And he adds that, I guess maybe this was just kind of his description of what Tiger the Gladiator would be. Di, you will find this hilarious. Strong, tick, fast, but also cuddly. <laughs> no, I do like that. I really do like that. I think Panther came close with her kind of claw-like thing there was a paw that she did a sort of lick the back of her hand I would love his signature to be something all of what you've just listed and then I just go up and give him a big cuddle <laughs> license to license to maul <laughs> a contender but die can a gladiator be cuddly I'd like to think so I think I am <laughs> and presumably his theme song would be eye of the tiger it had to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think if you if you you've gonna try and get a cuddle off a gladiator, you better come with a warning. What's the cost going to be? But yeah, Eye of the Tiger. I think it's one of the first pieces of music I ever actually choreographed something to in the early days when I lived and breathed, wanting to become a choreographer uh, as a young gymnast. I think uh, we used that. A lovely, brilliant signature tune for any gladiator. Did it involve you running up and down steps? I think it was a, a few really cheesy step ball change, step ball change type things. <laughs> Maybe a few leg lifts and a few somersaults. So uh, we used it as, a, as as part of our warm up sequence as young gymnasts in the in the squad training that I used to do. Step ball change, step ball change, forward roll, somersault. <laughs> Maybe that'll be a good one for him. <laughs> now, speaking of names, and it's now it's like dominated my mind today, just the, all the different names we could have. So let us know what you would have liked your name to have been if you were a gladiator and what your song would be as well. There's no point naming yourself if you don't come up with a song. And now that, that Di's mentioned it, we need to know what your kind of actions, what your you know entrance moves are going to be. And also while you're at it, why not let us know which events that you think you would have been good at? Because I... I've, oh gosh, I'm putting myself on the spot now. Unnecessarily putting myself on the spot. But I would, I think, I would have enjoyed Duel. I'm not sure I would have enjoyed The Wall. Certainly wouldn't have joined Hang Tough. I mean, if I ever go to see the monkey bars in the park, I've never been able to get beyond like two or three when it comes to that. So yeah, let us know which events that you, you would have been good at as well. So it's gladpod at gladiatorstv.com. Paul, just keeping with the theme of names, in your opinion, are there any names from other Glad shows around the world that you felt could have worked for the original Glad series? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think there's been 
so many names, really, really good ones used all across the world that could have worked, which is why I think it's always disappointing when the Gladiator shows have been revived and some of the names have been reused for some of the Gladiators like Panther and Siren and Warrior because there are so many to choose from and to add that personality to the Gladiator. I would say probably the Swedish Gladiators have had some amazing names over the years. They've had Attila, Electra, Indra, Kitsune, which is like a fox, Medusa. They've had so many, unlike Nigeria, who had hot dog, T-Rex and a bulldozer and Breeze. Not so much a gladiator name, but yeah, it just goes to show how each of the countries had quite a different selection over the years. What about the revival? Are there any names that you thought in a revival series? Oh, actually, they would have been good, one of the originals. I think Cyclone was quite a good name. I was always, back in the day, Tornado, and they had a Tornado. So yeah, Cyclone, although they're quite similar when you when you kind of put them together. Battleaxe, I thought, was quite a good name for a gladiator. I thought that was quite a, adds quite a lot of personality without even seeing who the gladiator was you knew that it was somebody who was going to really stand out so I think the Sky Revival the only thing that I didn't like was having like I said earlier the two panthers the two warriors the two sirens I think they could have been more creative if if any of the glad fans could think of alternative names for those gladiators send them in it would be great to hear I know I've got my own ideas as well but yeah that would be good if any fans could rename the the sky version of panther siren and warrior send them in it would be good to hear so go on then both of you what else do you think I should have been called not to be too self-indulgent but are any of the other glads like you think oh, I wish warrior had been called blah or hunter something different Any anyone spring to mind that you think oh actually a better name once you've seen that personality in the arena see for me I always think I can, it's really hard to think of you as not as Jet. I think that name really summed you up really, really well. I think some of the names that I struggled with were the likes of Rio. She was a lovely gladiator and it really did suit her personality because she was really smiley, but she was really tough and it was really hard. That was kind of the first batch of gladiator names that didn't seem very gladiatorial. So I always thought she should have been Electra or Raven or something like that rather than Rio. So I would have probably renamed Rio personally. I agree. I think a lot of the OGs I think the names were, were perfect for them I think as it went on I think the, the names and the, the character the personalities were perhaps a, a bit more at odds with one another Paul We've got a question here from Richard, who was lucky enough to go to a few shows as he, he'd always lived and he has always lived in Birmingham, including the final episode, which I know that you went to as well. He would like to know more about the event that never aired, Cyclothon. Now, he says he believes it was supposed to be included in one of the later series, along with Dogfight and Catapult. He also believes it appeared in the opening credits and program, but never aired, which is, I think, something you've already mentioned to me before. Would you be able to shed some light on its premise and the reason why. Yes, definitely. So the event was actually called Cyclotron and it was due to be part of a new kind of event in 1997 for Series 6, along with Tightrope, which did actually make it onto screen. The, the producers must have had quite a lot of kind of enthusiasm for the game because they actually did a CGI kind of visualisation and it was included in the opening sequence. So as the, the Gladiator's G is kind of moving around that, that video globe, what they used to have with all of the events on, there actually was a CGI. If you pause it, you can see it. It's this silver kind of circular thing with a, a, a bicycle going round. I did actually interview the event designer, John Coombs, a few years ago, and he gave me more information because it was included in the brochure, the event description and stuff. So basically it was supposed to be these two bikes and it was a gladiator on one bike, a contender on the other bike. And they basically had to cycle to go upside down and race each other around on these two kind of circles which is quite hard to describe i will do a post out as well with the uh event sketch if people want to know more basically they were to do that and then each time they went round if they won that lap, it would move the kind of detonator closer to this middle point, which would then, if they won, would detonate off the other person's bike and they would actually stall or it would explode or something like that. So it was quite a technical, obviously quite visual event. And I believe it got all the way through to being built, but it was so heavily reliant on mechanics for it to operate that although they kind of built it and stuff, it just 
didn't work and they had to scrap it, which is really disappointing because obviously they'd gone to so much effort and really at this stage, it was really hard to get new events that were safe enough, but still had that visual payoff for TV and for the gladiators. So yeah, sadly they had to scrap it and it was never never used or brought back and obviously they'd probably invested quite a lot of money in it as well so thank you very much oracle is which i think it was the moniker that Dai gave you in back in series one if you have any more questions for the oracle you can get in touch with us and share your glad stories and questions by emailing gladpod at gladiators tv.com you can also send them on facebook twitter and instagram let's crack on with this week's show three Hello and welcome to today's The Glad Pod. Oh my word. We have Emmy winning TV film director, producer and far from nasty, my favourite dance competition judge, but to you and I and from the world of Glad, it is none other than our gladiator godfather, Nigel Lithgow, OBE. Nigel, (laughs) hello. Oh, I'm so pleased I came on with that uh, introduction. It looks beautiful where you are. Make us all a little bit envious. Well, I'm on the beautiful island of Barbados. So I'm here gently relaxing, bringing my family over and playing a lot of golf. Nigel, take us back (sighs) quite a while ago. It'll be coming up 30 years. How did Gladiators ever even arrive as a concept to your mind and come to the UK shores? Well, it was a late night American show that was on London weekend television. Uh, And it was going out about 11 o'clock or 11.30, sometimes midnight, and it got a following. So I was working for London weekend television at the time doing comedy entertainment series with a guy called Brian Connolly. And I was asked, because of my background in choreography, I was asked if I would look at this program and did I think it might work in the UK. So uh, I duly did that. And I said, absolutely. And I must say, I watched it with my two boys at the time and they loved it. So I knew it was going to appeal to a wide age group. And and, and I would have thought at the beginning it would have been male skewed. That wasn't the case at the end of the day. It was family skewed. And that was, I think, which made it a, a huge success. And so I got invited over to America to meet with the production company in the States that was run by Samuel Goldwyn Jr. Now, if you've ever heard of uh, MGM, you know that his father was a huge uh, film producer in America. And it was a great honor to meet him. And we went through how the program evolved. And I don't know if you know how the program evolved, but it was brought out by a a character who loved Elvis Presley and sort of emulated him, had the big, long sideburns, dyed black hair. Uh, Johnny Ferraro, I think his name was. And he came up with this concept of um, truckers, uh, truckers bringing their trucks into a circle, uh, like an encampment, and then coming out and attacking each other with huge wrenches and goodness knows what else. And it was a movie. It was this movie that was creating these violent and vicious games. Uh, and it slowly morphed for somehow, and I, I wasn't there for the morphing, so I can't tell you, into this battle of the stronger against the weaker, which is what, in fact, Gladiators was. Although, as you know, Diane, they weren't all weak when they came on the show. They sometimes knocked hell out of the Gladiators. So that's how it started. So what I didn't understand was that they would put up say, hang tough, and then have a walkthrough audience. And they would do three or four shows just with hang tough. And Mm -hmm. then they would put up another day, they would put up the wall and then do three or four shows with the wall and then would edit them together to a complete program. Well, it gave no excitement to the audiences that were walking through the studio because they didn't know who they were supporting, why they were supporting them. So my concept was to do a complete show so that we would find a studio or a space large enough to be able to put all the equipment up so that you could watch the contestants go through a show and really support them, which in fact is is what occurred to the point that we were getting 7,000 people in that audience in the afternoon and another 7,000 in the evening. But as you well know, it didn't start like that. It started with about 300 people in a 7,000 seater and Kenny Warwick, the other uh, executive on the program and I, doing it a bit like Moses part in the Red Sea where the camera <laughs> shot was, 
we'd move the 400 round to back that camera shot. And then we moved the audience around again to cover that camera shot, which was hilarious for our first season. And thank goodness we were successful and it, it went on to, as you know, great heights. Well, Nigel, when we spoke to John Sachs, he was saying that, especially building up to the launch of that first series, it had to be a success just because of the amount of resource that was put into it. Is that kind of where, where you were thinking at the time? Uh, well, the, the fact is that first season, you know, we had never done it before. We had spent months preparing it. We finally got permission to use the National Indoor Arena in Birmingham. We went through the whole process of naming the gladiators, auditioning the gladiators, naming them for their attributes, and went through some incredible names. We thought wind would be a great name until somebody said, no, you can't have that. <laughs> I mean, it sounds awful. Oh, wind just blew up. No, anyway, so it was all of that sort of thing. And we used to laugh in the, but to actually, when we were faced with it, and we employed Kimpton Walker mm -hmm. to build these enormous sets uh, and this floor that had some spring to it, but with lights underneath, like it was almost like a helicopter landing pad. So we had gone, as you rightly say, to great expense with this. The problem was when we'd completed the series, it had to be edited. And we thought that we were going to get the editing done in a number of days, weeks, maybe. And it took about six weeks of being in an edit suite. And I would have my bosses come in and say, when will you be finished? And I used to say, when it's ended, it was, I don't know if you ever saw a movie called The Agony and the Ecstasy. And it was about the painting of the Sistine Chapel. And the Pope kept coming up and saying, when will it be ended? And Michelangelo said, when it's finished. It was that scenario. I had no idea to be able to tell them when it would be finished. We, we, I literally wanted it to be pristine. And I was producing and directing it at that point. So the weight of the world was on my shoulders. Thank goodness we got through it. And I wasn't sure we were going to be that successful after that first season, but the figures slowly grew over it. And the gladiators were then starting to be recognized. And certainly Jet came through as a huge success, as did Wolf. And then others followed, Lightning, Warrior, and then Shadow, of course, loomed up <laughs> Uh, the contestants and, and they became heroes which was the important thing that sold the show I mean it was a complete stab in the dark I mean you come from a dance I mean, you know when we train as dancers or athletes we kind of know what we're working towards we rehearse rehearse it's known territory until it's perfection this is a colossus that you were bringing together when was it in your instinct did you think actually this is going to work it is going to work as long as the audiences you said like it i've got something here was there ever a moment when you thought yes no <laughs> no it, it, i just got you know we got through it and we loved it i've got to say we loved it we loved it before we even started it but to be able to turn around to you and say yes i thought we've got a massive hit no, i couldn't say that and i got more and more frightened as the process went on and in the edit suite it was every day i'd come in and, and my heart would be beating to see how much we could get done today because we had so many cameras on it so many angles and we had those huge metal balls the atmospheres rolling all over the place and you didn't know who was in that one or that one and <laughs> I, I, I wanted to try and point out who it was otherwise the game made no sense uh, and that took ages to try and edit you know and it never got any better we just got quicker at it yeah no i bet and actually john sachs was spoke a lot about it as well and how he was because originally it was you trying to do it so that he was commentating or it was trying to be done as if live but then in the end it worked out much easier in sort of in the edit suite as well so it was fascinating to hear that that side of it from him but for you selecting those original 12 gladiators what were you looking for connection with an audience a strength, speed, uh, or all of the attributes that they would have needed because it, it was tough to be a gladiator, no question about it. it. It was also tough and bruising of the egos when you were beaten as a gladiator. Not one of them enjoyed being beaten for the very nature is that they were hailed as heroes. So we needed, I, I guess, 
all of the fitness side of it, the beauty side of it too. We needed people, they were going to be stars, you know? So we needed people that would look like stars at the end of the day. But the main attribute they needed was strength and balls, to be honest with you, because they were going to be facing some real trials and tribulations. So there was that combination then, presumably at the tryouts, there must have been some people that stood out straight away but then presumably you need to also see how they acted in front of the camera as well Uh, absolutely Uh, and i remember we were doing a road climb and this young fireman came in he wanted to do it and everyone sort of using their arms and their feet to climb up this rope and this guy was up there without any feet just straight up with his arms straight back down again and he became saracen you know he was a great personality right from the beginning michael or wolf we weren't sure about until we named him and then he took on the entire character but he was when we first saw him we thought always oh, maybe a little too old it doesn't you know that straggly hair or I don't know. <laughs> and then then we thought no hey hey we need a baddie. This is pantomime land. And he took it on. And he outshone what we thought he could have been, to be honest. Uh, we thought he was magnificent at the end of the day. I mean, dragging kids out of the audience and dropping them in trash cans and waste paper baskets. Fabulous. It's outrageous. And, you know, we didn't turn to do that. He became that character. We watched it develop. It wasn't just about my my team. It was the gladiators themselves that developed their own characters uh, and became the success that they were. And I think it was the first show ever on British television that was sponsored. And Kellogg's actually sponsored gladiators. And if you remember, they were on Kellogg's Cornflakes packets, along with Tony the Tiger and, you know, the normal people, the normal people, the normal things you have on Kellogg's Cornflake packets, and there were the gladiators. Did you have any preconceived ideas as to how you wanted the whole look of the show, including your gladiators? Because something, what you just said then was lovely, because you did allow us to kind of organically develop who we were as personas for the audience at home, to the point where you actually also made us call each other by our gladiator names on the shop floor for that first season. I felt so weird. I mean, you can't say, Michael, Michael, come here. And this guy's going, (laughs) Michael, Michael. You know, you've got to say, Wolf, come here. So, yeah, no, there was a huge team behind it, Diane, that, you know, that we had the designer of the outfits that you wore. We had the designer of the whole look of it. We had incredible builders in, in, in Kimpton Walker, a great camera team. After the first season, we even brought in good directors. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a great team. And talking about a team, Eureka and Fash, very good presenting duo. They yeah. were so nervous. Yes, that, that first episode. Yes. Fash was drinking from a little flask and passing it to Ulrika. Ulrika held her alcohol better than Fash did. It was like, oh, is there, is there? At one point, <laughs> what did he just say? That, but they were so nervous. Horrible outfits to wear on that first season. It was a, <laughs> clung to her body and it would, just wasn't nuts. Yeah. But what was it about them that made you pick them as the presenting duo for it? She was beautiful. I thought she, I saw her on, she was a weather girl, yeah. and you're always looking for new talent to bring to the screen, or I am. And she was just, number one, beautiful, and number two, enthusiastic and happy and bright. Uh, and that's what I wanted for this program. Fash, I wasn't certain of to begin with, but I know I needed a sports star. I knew I, I needed a sports star to, to link it into sport and not just entertainment because it had to be sport. It was so physical. It had to be recognized that what they were actually doing uh, was they weren't playing. This mm. was real. And it needed somebody from that world. When I interviewed him, Again, he was bright, sparky, lively, loved it. And it was the love, I think, of both Ulrika and Fash for the show that actually came across in their presentation. Of Absolutely. It. And talking about credibility, where on earth did you find John Anderson? He was brought in by the, and I can't remember the company's name now, that actually came up with the games and the ideas for another series called Ice Warriors. But they found him. I, I pinched him. But he's a real character, wasn't he? You'd come from such a creative background then to create this a mass, massive show that you're getting the wonderful balances, as we've established, of credibility 
quality of athleticism to show business, making it look beautiful. I'll always remember just how your lighting design, the sense of colour, the sense of drama. Do you look back now and, and realise that you'd created that or is it just again a process that happened automatically? Forgive me for saying it, but I don't feel as though I created it. There was a creation which we then improved upon and that's an awful lot easier than creating. It is looking at something and saying, look, we can make this better. You know, don't forget, they originally had what we called the Travelator at the beginning of their final course. And we moved it because I thought they're going to be so tired at the end of completing this. This is really going to add drama to it. Will they make it up when they are so tired? I mean, every one of them was fit enough to get up at 10 times before they actually did the course. But when they came to the end of that, it really gave, and sometimes it was unfair. I mean, we all thought, oh no, oh no, please get up there, please get up, which was all part of the attraction of gladiators. And it was that one little thing on the end of that course, I think, that made the greatest difference between the UK version and the American version. And then if you remember, the Americans wanted us to make their shows. And then we did the international gladiators and everything else. So was the UK version, in your opinion, better than that American version that you first limped your eyes on in November 1991? Not just a little bit better, far better. And I'm only saying that because it had that crowd behind it as well. And of course, that was all American football crowd with the big hands. And then we used all of the music to introduce the gladiators, even to the point that Simon Cowell stole one of our tracks, you know, to use for X Factor. I mean, these, they were iconic pieces of music. The boys are back in town, all, all of those. And it just lifted the entire thing, which the Americans didn't have. And which is why Samuel Goldwyn eventually turned around and said, can we do our shows with you. Will you make our shows for us? And why we were invited over to Australia to take the gladiators to Australia, which was <laughs> which was very funny. I can tell you a story about that. The British gladiators are here, the Australian, and they go, boo, boo. And I'm saying, no, no, stop them booing. You don't boo the gladiators. You boo the content. The gladiators are heroes. So they're still booing. I said, let me go out there. So I went out there and I said, listen, here we are in Brisbane, in Queensland. I said, we brought the gladiators to you because you are the greatest gladiator audience. <laughs> we didn't take them to wherever, wherever. We brought them to you. <laughs> and because you're great supporters. <laughs> and we know you're going to support the British gladiators. Boo! It was a complete turnaround and we couldn't stop them booing. And unfortunately, the British gladiators lost against the Australians, which we only ever did it once, but I was determined to go back and do it again. And it was at that point that my son was over there, fell in love with a, a young lady, got married, and I've got three lovely grandchildren. So it was worth going to Australia with the gladiators. So Di won't really appreciate me for asking this, Nigel, but I am keen to know, when, the, when was the first time you'd seen Diane Udell? And what were, what were your first thoughts when you saw her at that first trial out? Can you remember? Um, I, I will not go into detail, but I remember very well. I, I'll say in a mild way, I thought she was rather attractive. And what a... And what about the names? How did they come to the fruition? Was it, did you align them with the personality or did you already have kind of characters in mind that you wanted those people to be moulded into? We aligned them with the personality. You know, we also got into trouble and we were told that we were being racist, which was totally not in our character at all. We called Saracen Saracen because he was a, a tank, number one, if you remember Saracen tanks. Uh, and number two, because the Saracens were a great warrior race, as we remember them from history. We called Judy Nightshade because she, again, that was like a Marvel character. And, but, you know, but they put it because we called her Nightshade because she was black. And we called her Nightshade because she was deadly. It was had nothing to do with her being black. Okay. It was night, so they're going, oh, night, black. And there were so many things made up that just weren't true. Wolf obviously became Wolf because of that. Jet because of her speed. Lightning because she was sparky. We literally did it like that. And as I say, wind didn't come into it. <laughs> we're happy. We're happy to add. I love that. Is it true that by the time you you then give, give us each, given us each a kind of a handle, a brand as such, a name, that you were looking for the theme tunes and you'd listen to the theme tunes in the office and go, that's got to be Jet. That's got to be what was that like yeah that's absolutely true and, and you know kenny and i came from the background we grew up together in liverpool uh, since we were 12 years of age 
Um, I brought him in as the producer. We work very closely and we both love music. We, we just find the tracks. We did the choreography with the crowd, as you well know, you know, two hands up, one hand, <laughs> two, you know, whatever. And it just involved everybody. You know, when you're in an arena like that, you can't just have the focus in one small area. The whole arena has got to come alive. Uh, and certainly with the music, with the action and the audience, therefore adding to that energy. That's what we were trying to capture. Just while I remember that, I remember one day, night you walked, going back to the whole dance back, Background and your creative approach to putting on any show. I remember you walked into the arena one day and I think you whipped out a triple pirouette and then just walked off casually. <laughs> I'm just like, what went on there? And I think you used to make comments to me about once a dancer, always a dancer. I related so strongly to that. And of course you brought Kenny in as well. And I felt, for me personally, having my my bosses who are ex-dancers, it, I've, I've, it felt a really great place to work. I just wanted to say that right now because I know where it was being born from? Well, Kenny brought in G-Force and, and they were great as well to bring things together. It was, we were making it more Americanized than the Americans were doing and, and loving it for it. Uh, there, was, there was one story I can tell you which always scared the hell out of me because we did Celebrity Gladiators, if you remember. And we had Vinnie Jones on and the boxer Gary Mason. We were walking them around the course and I don't remember, maybe you'll remember Di, how high a above the ground where the zip line was. So they climb up the cargo net to get to that to go down on the zip line. And as they both got up there and they were being walked around the course, Vinnie Jones pushed, literally pushed, Gary Mason off the top, who fell head first into the red matting below. That morning, we had discussed maybe moving that matting, because it was literally just underneath the uh, zip line there, and bringing it further forward in case anybody overshot. Oh. And we forgot to do it. Thank God. And he looked up and he said, oh, that's going to give me a bit of a headache. And that was it. And he was fine. But we thought, this Vinnie Jones has got to be crazy to literally push him off. And uh, we, we, we just thanked God later that day that we hadn't moved that matting. And it was only because somebody forgot to do it. So there's one for the archives. Absolutely. Those iconic costumes by Stephen Adnett, they land, you know, it wasn't just one set of drawings you got in front of you. There were different ideas for it. Why did you go for those iconic costumes? Well, we went for the costumes because, number one, that they could move in them, which was really important. And they made statements. And and the statements related to who we wanted their persona to be. So again, that if they were ever unhappy with their costume, then we tried to look at it and change it and, and move it around. We never said, you've got to wear this. But they, they were, as, as you said, iconic. And they became I iconic. And we believed that they would do. And so much of it at that point, you know, when you're doing something like this, you don't always get it right. And, and certainly, and I can't remember anything we got wrong now, but I know we did get a lot of things wrong. So you're going with gut feelings at the end of the day. That's all you can do. You can sort of ask people, get their opinions. But then, you know, as the executive producer, you've got to say, this is what we're doing. Iconic costumes, iconic music as well. How did Muff get on get on board with, with the theme tune? Yeah, he was great. Was I mean, you're reminding me of these names and, uh, that I forgot, you know. I don't, I can't remember how I got hold of him. I just can't remember. Uh, but he he was just brilliant and and each year he'd come back with another theme or another uh, and we play them and go oh i don't see that for this game it's not busy enough send it back to him and then he'd send another one back and it was absolutely perfect so he just took notes as well as writing a lot of notes but he was he was very good at understanding where we were coming from i remember we made a comment once again that i think the arena floor was quite empty there was no rigging up for any specific event it was pre season shoot and it's probably the time he did the triple pirouette and just waltzed off gracefully and left me in your dirt. I'm like, heat dust die. That's Nigel being an amazing dancer still. But you made a comment to me, I'll never forget, and you said, you know, because you'd been promoted and I think to head of light entertainment as well, and you were being taken further and further away from your hands-on approach to creating a show like Glad's. And it didn't sit well with you at the time, did it? I miss Glad's, I must say. I, when I handed it over, as you well know, to Ken, I tried to step back, but only time I came up to see you, I'd always sort of push Ken aside and take over. But yeah, no, I missed, I missed Glad's. 
Sure. I mean, it was an incredible vehicle to drive. One person that you mentioned a little bit earlier on, and actually I'm always, I'm keen to find out your thoughts during this, was Shadow and him leaving. Big change in Gladiators in terms of the journey that it was on at that point. I think what I get, certainly from what Di was saying as well, it was a huge blow to the show, but was it a huge blow to you as well? Well, don't forget, you know, I was, a number of Gladiators were on steroids. It's no surprise, you don't get body like that from sleeping in crow bags. We said, if you, whenever you're coming near this show, you better hadn't touch anything because we are going to test you. And if you test positive, you are out on your ear. And in general, they were really good, I would say. Whatever they did outside of their contractual time, we didn't bother with. But in the contractual time, they were tested more than Olympic athletes and at different times of the day and everything else. So we felt really clean, if you like. So when these allegations started coming in, you know, I, I come from a, as dice, as a dance background, an entertainment background, a lot of comedy with Malcolm and Wise and, uh, and everything else. And now here I am in front of the press trying to explain steroid use. I haven't got a, do, listen, do I look like I use steroids for God's sake? So I haven't got a clue what they're talking about. But what happened with Shadow uh, was a different thing. And that was um, a cocaine. He was accused of taking cocaine. And the great thing about watching Shadow prepare to go up in for the pugil sticks was he would put on the heaviest metal music and and literally his brain must have been going because it was so loud you could hear it through his helmet and his earpiece and he would wind himself up like this to get up there at no point did we dream he was doing any drugs and when this allegation came i literally sat him down and i said are you doing drugs are you doing what they're alleging here and i got absolutely not no. Uh, and I guess I wanted to believe him because I didn't want to lose him. When we did lose him, uh, I, it was a great shame. And I, it wasn't a great shame for the show. Obviously, he was a loss. But it was a great shame for him because he had built up such a wonderful character. He was a hero for so many young kids, so many young black kids to see this guy outshine anything that was put in front of him. So in letting those kids down, that's where the shame was. And it broke my heart. I'll be honest with you. I was distraught that he would let himself down and so many other people. I remember actually, Nigel, I had a one-to-one -one meeting with you booked on the back of possibly the last time you ever had a face-to-face -face with Jeff uh, Shadow. And he stormed past me at the ITV Towers on the South Bank at the time. And he'd had his meeting. And I think then you just literally told him, I have to let you go. And didn't you not, you offered him chance to kind of get support, get help, sit on GMTV sofas and say, kids, lose a season, come back the next year, I paid a price. You did all that for him, didn't you? Well, the, the great thing about, you know, America is you can make that kind of mistake and rectify it by saying, I was stupid, I was dumb, mm -hmm. I will never let that happen again. And yes, he had the opportunity of doing that. Goodness knows I wanted him to, again, not just for the sake of the show, but for his own reputation and for what disaster that, that might cause in the kids who loved him, yeah. what that might do to affect their lives. Going back to the show, though, once the, the obviously I left after an accident, which made me think, you know what, I, it's not worth sitting in a chair for a wheelchair. I know a lot of people survive spinal injuries amazingly, but I I thought enough was enough. Was that off Hang Tough or the or the big pole? It was at the live event in 1996 at Wembley. It was on a, on Pyramid. I don't think you were there. It was we were again. It was when we were rehearsing new contenders in to see if they'd be good on screen. Little high eight camera flying around, getting the footage to see if people worked on camera well. And it was at the last time we were at the old Wembley Stadium Arena as well. And it was that. That's when I and I didn't go back for the the fifth series. The filming that summer because it just scared me too much I'm afraid but what were your view on the injuries that you did because obviously the contenders were getting faster harder sharper stronger the accident rates were going up what was going on for you then we wanted to make the equipment as safe as possible number yeah. one then after that you know whether you're whatever you do in sport there are injuries that you yeah. have to accept the only injury that I think was brought on that was meant was I think Paul the, the policeman the contender I can't remember his other name, Paul. And he was presenting the UK against the Americans. And one of the American gladiators literally punched him 
in the floating ribs, which cracked his ribs and did it on purpose because this guy was so good. He was our champion along with Eunice Huttart and that was done on purpose. That I could never forgive. But accidents, falling, sometimes, you know, they grab you around the neck to pull you off or whatever, mm -hmm. off hang tough. That will happen. I mean, a combative uh, sport. You were against each other. You were fighting each other. So there are going to be accidents. And I sort of shielded myself from worrying too much about that. With deciding which gladiators to replace and come and go, because, you know, first series, we lost Hawk and we lost Phoenix. At the end of each series, are you sitting down and going, right, this person we're taking on, this person, we're going to find someone else? Y yes, you have to do that. And you'd base it on how successful they've been as gladiators. Phoenix... Flame was another one, I think. I can't remember. And you just say, are, are they doing well? Are they winning over 50% of their battles? If you're winning over 50%, you're a hero in my book. If you're not doing that, then you're not a gladiator. You must be one of the contestants. You had to win as a gladiator a certain amount. Otherwise, the, the audience would think, oh, God, I hope she's up, uh, she's up against Phoenix because she'll kill Phoenix. And you don't want that. You want your team to be the best team. Like any team sport, because don't forget, they were a team at the end of the day. You replace the worst players. You have to. When it comes to trying to do a successful show, you've got to plow your way through a lot of obstacles. And in order to do that, you've got to be, at times, a little mean-spirited. And in other times, you've got to be the general that is leading your team. And if you find you're going in the wrong direction and you've made a mistake, you've got to say, hey, we made a mistake. We don't want to go that way. We're going to go that way. And you need to be in control to the point that people go that way on that occasion and know that they're doing the right thing by supporting you. But in order for them to support you, you've got to be right maybe 61% of the time. You actually had a hand in devising some of the new events as well that came in. What were they and, and what made you come up with the, the ideas for them? The, the, the swinging ball was one of them. The pole where the got sucked in, the actual climb of, you know. Hola. It was one of those things that you... you <laughs> You're living and breathing the program. At the time you're working on it, you're living and breathing it. So just because you go for a drink at the end of the night or something, the brain is still going on without you even thinking about it. And then these things just develop out of it. It was just great fun, a great time. It was one of the greatest shows I've ever done that I uh, ever enjoyed. You know, it, it was, we all felt part of it. We lived it. We lived every game that went on and we supported you. And sometimes we supported the contestants too. What was your favourite thing actually about the show itself? I think the boldness of it. I think the, the size and scale of it and the involvement of the audience. I mean, I keep going back to that audience because when you've got 7,000 people, it must be like a rock star, you know, when you've got all these people shouting and screaming and you're up on that stage, it created such a wonderful drive of energy. And you see these kids just loving it and standing and cheering. And you think, I'm part of this, or I, I did this, or I made you do this with your hands, or you just... It, just gets in your body, really. It's like an electricity, like an electric charge. And, and the sad thing was I didn't need drugs or cocaine or anything, and neither did he, because he was driven by that audience as well. And that's the best drug in the world. When your adrenaline comes out, you feel great on it and you don't need to, any other substance. And I loved it for that. It just drove my adrenaline. Did you think it was the right time to end? In, so in 1999, 2000, that final series? I, honestly, I don't know. I wasn't involved in the last series, as it were. That would have been all about the business side of it. Was it bringing in the commercials, the money? Was it paying for itself? Were the viewers falling off it? So that was made by the network, I'm sure, that decision. I always thought, it could have been brought back. I didn't think how they brought it back. I think it was on Sky, was it? I didn't see it, but I was told it just wasn't the bold, big show that it used to be. And you can't do that. The one thing that you've got to do is make it even bigger and even bolder. Nigel, you were awarded your OBE in 2015, and you're saying GLADS was one of the biggest, most exciting parts of your career. As you're, as you're sitting there now, you're still really active with, with your career and everything you're doing. What's kind of one of your favourite memories from the show? The whole thing, you said that there's a zeitgeist of it being a family show, there was nothing like it, but do you have a personal kind of little memory that you think, yeah, 
that stayed with me forever. I, I, I honestly think trying to find something small in that show would be very difficult. Mm. Why I love that show is because it was so big and the whole thing moved in one direction. And that is really difficult when you're driving something that big. And so all of the little parts all came together to form the whole. And to pick out any single little part would have been unfair on the whole because that is what I remember. The only other thing like that that I've done, there was a thing called Idol Gives Back where we literally went around the world to create a charitable show using the idols and everything else. And we raised something like $71 million in one night. That was gratifying, to say the least. An American Idol in itself, you know, when you're going around the whole of America finding talent, was just as thrilling as Gladiators. I just love those big scale productions you know it feels terrific was it a risk to have it in the national indoor arena as opposed to like like the american series did in just a tv studio it, it took me a while to sell the show like that you know because no one had done it before they thought that we should literally take the american blueprint and do it that way and i kept explaining that there was no atmosphere no atmosphere at all you get people wandering through and they see six hang tufts so what? They can cheer or whatever, but it means nothing because you don't know. So you see Eunice Huttart, for instance, do hang tough. That's it. Mm-hmm. You don't see her in the next one or the next one or the next one. And so I, I kept trying to explain this to the point that twisted someone's arm, I guess, in the uh, top position. Uh, John K. Cooper was the head of entertainment at that point, And he was, got to say, very strongly behind everything that I was doing. So I'm very grateful to him. But then there were other people like Greg Dyke and everyone else, you know, they're big bosses there going, really, you're going to do this in the national indoor arena? Yeah, why not? So come on then, Nigel, who were your favourites? That would be really unfair of me to say that. <laughs> I was proud, seriously, I was proud of every single one of them. I mean, often they would, you know, we'd have a roster of you're doing this, you're doing that. Some of them were carrying injuries, they carried on. Favourite people would make it easier for me to say, but Gladiator, and I wouldn't even tell you that, but Gladiators, they really were, and I'm not doing a Bruce, I'm not doing a Bruce Forsyth. <laughs> um, it was just that they were all terrific and, and all worked really hard. Which were your favourite events? Loved Hang Tough, loved the final elimination course because that gave us so much drama. One thing I had to ask you about, Nigel, was Dangerous Brian. Whose idea was it to combine the two shows so hilariously? It was Brian's. It was Brian's. But my favourite bit is we would have cotton round his ears, just so he could do that with his ears. And he'd be pulling it down here. And his ears were fun. Dangerous Brian was a lot of fun. But that was, you know, I was doing the Brian Connolly show when I got Gladiator. So it just fitted in together. Most of the Gladpots we speak to, especially now as, as we're doing them virtually as well, they, they keep picking out keepsakes or souvenirs from the show. Where do you keep all of your keepsakes and souvenirs? Are they in a locked vault somewhere? Um, I don't have that many souvenirs. Um, I've got the original Gladiator mags, the magazines, the superhero magazines. I've got some of the originals of those where they actually hand drew them. And so they're they're in a, a cupboard or a drawer, but no, I haven't got my pugil stick. I don't have that many photographs either. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, th- I think I was always too busy to even think about this. There's, there's certain things that your brain ignores only because you can't have it everywhere, you know? And there's an awful lot that my brain <laughs> ignored during the <laughs> during the shows. The big question that we always ask our guests, should gladiators make a comeback? Could it work in today's TV landscape, do you think? They're doing a lot of sort of gladiatorial games here on American television and the Titan games and different things like that. No, I don't. To be frank, I would like to keep the memory of what it was and and let other people develop other things that there is never going to be another gladiators i don't see that success ever coming to another gladiatorial games style show in the future i just don't see it Um, i think at some point you have to walk away from perfection what an absolutely wonderful way to end this (laughs) for now nige because there's so much more i'm sure most people when they've been interviewed go oh and there was that memory and that memory it would be great to catch up with you again would that be all right of course 
maybe I'll try and remember more. Or maybe you can uh, slip me the questions before I come on. That's the thing. There were so there were so many kind of specific questions or moments in that in that time, which was thirty years ago. It was always going to, going to be the way. But Paul, oh, I mean, did, did you want to just hop in here? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Nigel because I was one of those kids that was in that audience, like every show almost watching it on the TV. And the vision that you all had as a, as a team is just inspired me through my life. It was more than a TV show for me. It inspired what I do is my career, the graphics, the music, the set, everything that you did on that show has, has totally just been part of my life. So I just wanted to really thank you for me just being a fan, but also all of the community of fans that we've got that still actively hold this show as like part of their heart as, as kind of something that they just truly loved. So I just wanted to thank you for everything that you did on the show. Well, I will go on to repeat, it was a team effort uh, and we had an incredible team that came together and all worked for the same end. It did produce something that, you know, I do believe was iconic and will be remembered by everybody that saw it and participated in it. So thank you very much for creating the podcast. And I'm so pleased that people listen. Oh, I loved that so much. Now, Di, first question for you. Are you feeling a bit more relaxed now? Because you definitely p- different persona for you there from all the other Glad Pods. It was like you said like you went back 30 years and you were suddenly like, yes, hi, Nigel. Hi. Yes, Nigel. What, Nigel? Yes, I'll do it, Nigel. How high? How fast? Yes, please. Oh, my boss. <laughs> I, d- I kind of went back 30 years nearly and, and suddenly felt terrified. <laughs> Isn't it interesting what anchors you hold to somebody who basically, I mean, he was a bit of a Sven Gali. I think it was even commented on at the time about my career. So I, I have a lot, a lot of thanks and gratitude to somebody who helped me find my gladiator, uh, of which I would never have been able to do had he not spotted it in that original audition. So yeah, a definite gear shift for me. I'm feeling slightly embarrassed. <laughs> a definite gear shift for me to be speaking to Nigel, who is being so recognised now to this day for everything he's been doing for popular and light entertainment TV across the globe. I mean, these guys are creatively brilliant and started out, like me, as nothing other than a, a hoofer, as he calls it, a dancer in the dance studio. But dancers tend to have brilliant vision. They obviously it's a visual thing that we do went on into tv and started to become his own creator of his own shows and the rest is history and we the fact we're even speaking about him and to him now how lucky would we get to get that time with him you know he's still he's creating a lot of stir still to this day and and shaping further people uh, people's further careers i always thought that kind of nasty nigel uh, monica was perhaps a bit unfair on him and actually the thing that I took and the thing that he that he definitely looked down the camera as, as we were talking about that and he was saying Look, I had to be nasty when I needed to be but then you think about it from the other side is it was his baby he wanted to make it the best that he possibly could and actually whilst his memory from that time may not be the best I was fascinated by actually how much he did remember and also even today he still holds gladiators very very dear to his heart yeah he certainly does I've got one word that I think of when I think of Nigel and that's elite I can just picture the kind of the dance master tapping his cane in the you know like from fame in the dance studio because that's where he really you know to train hard and become successful as a dancer any dancer listening or athlete listening will know what goes into that and it's visceral it's in your neurology and what he's gone on to do and I I know this through the psychology and the therapy work that I do do once you've learned what that feels like you pretty much can then you have that same force and drive with anything you need to turn your hand then too in your life you've got to be careful not to become a perfectionist and then down on yourself if you don't hit your bar each time but it's very much a trait and Nigel is elite no he is and, and Paul for you putting together the notes for a chat like that I mean the notes were extensive we didn't perhaps cover everything that we we may wanted to cover whether it's because not really sure whether he's going to remember it or or not or whether it's just going with the flow of the conversation so maybe at some stage we'll have to get him back on maybe with simon too but from your perspective from a a glad fan perspective that was a good chat wasn't it yeah i mean when i was arranging the chat with nigel and asked him to appear on the glad pod i think one of the big draws of it was obviously 
having Die Jet as the co-host and he was very keen to to catch up again and, and reconnect but also he was really positive and happy that he wanted to remember the show and like you said getting the god of gladiators to to speak to us and and dedicate his and be so generous with his time and be so open and honest about everything i think really showed his love of the show the vision that he had what he wanted to create and also what he'd seen from the American version but what he knew he could bring to from being an expert in entertainment and and knowing what would work for the UK audience he's an incredibly talented man and so much as like his vision of the show but then also selecting the individual gladiators as well like he kind of discussed there was a role for each of them as we've discussed in previous glad pods even from selecting jet but then also investing in you die and, and pushing you like you say with your presenting career your recording career as an artist and he, how he wanted to kind of push you in those different areas aside from gladiators he obviously saw something in you and the others that he he could really push you as a person as well which i think shows that he kind of thought more about you guys as individuals as well as the show itself if that makes sense I agree absolutely he was he was never short of looking looking at people and seeing their maybe their full potential I think we 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 had a bond I'd say because we as I said we were probably the only two who'd started in a, nothing other than a sweaty dance studio and I think dancers tend to have an affinity with other dancers because we're it's highly visual the business that we're in it's also physically very demanding like an athlete and there's always a a bit of a camaraderie and a bond and I felt that bond very early on with Nigel. Well even like all of the work that he did with the G-Force girls like choreographing their routines and and you didn't even see that side of things on the TV as much but that opening sequence anyone who's been to to watch Gladiators live would know that the the cheerleaders did like a whole five minute routine before the show even started to just set the tone and that's where it was very much even though that was never shown on TV it was creating that live experience for all of those people in the arena and he very much approached the filming of a TV show as an experience and like more than just the TV show if that makes sense it was kind of you gone there to see something and he knew how to put all of that together but still come up with the end result of the TV program at the end of it but he was so entertaining with all of the segments in between like you say the whole intro things that you just wouldn't even see on the TV so for him to kind of invest that time and effort selecting the the opening sequences for the gladiators of their individual theme tunes and how they come out again never seen on tv but just coming at it from a a live show perspective was yeah just that attention to detail absolutely pure theater and i think anybody who comes from a theater background background you've got no quick cuts and edits and fancy digital or lighting that you can put on it you've got just nothing other than raw talent human talent as your play to make this piece of theatre work. So if he brought those ingredients forward with then his very skilled knowledge in emerging light entertainment TV, he literally brought the the whole package into everyone's corner of their living rooms or wherever your TV is on a Saturday night, beautifully, beautifully sealed and presented and packaged and uh, got nothing than utter and total respect. One last thing on, on GeForce though. After I had my accident, I pleaded with both Kenny and Nige to go... Can I be a cheerleader? Because sort of dancing, you know, popping around at the end of the arena, how doing a fantastic dance routine, as you said, Paul, for the for the opening of before the shooting live was really in my heart and soul, and wouldn't have damaged my back, so I wouldn't have had to hit anybody or fall from great heights. And I said, please, I'll, I'll put a wig on. I'll, I'll, I'll just look different. And they're like, no. If you're coming back into the arena, it can only ever be as Jet. And I'm like, oh, I really wanted to be on G Force after I left because dance was still something I knew I could do that wouldn't. Hurt. And they said no. <laughs> I was just in complete awe of him just doing that that chat in itself. And what I thought was amazing was even you know obviously we mentioned that the fact that he was in Barbados and enjoying the sun. The way that even though he's thousands of miles away and he's doing something virtually, how he was able to hold the room, for want of a better expression, virtually, was a true skill and a true talent. And the time just flew by for me. So I was just, yeah, hands up. I absolutely, that's definitely one of my uh, favourite GladPod episodes. And I I would stress for everyone listening to this GladPod and and thanks Di and Paul for this week, but I definitely feel like we probably will at some stage get Nigel back on. So if you do have questions that perhaps we did 
didn't ask or, or things that you'd like Nigel to to answer, then do get in touch with us, gladpod at gladiatorstv.com. That's the uh, the best email address. You can also send us a message on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Good competition, good spirit, great sportsmanship as both contenders show mutual respect. Join us again next week for the ultimate challenge, the might of... 